What is up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, as always, Jack Manuel. What's up, Jack? DSGNTree.com slash off the glass. Yes, you need to go there, cop some Brooklyn Buzz gear, you know, check it out. We got some t-shirts, hopefully throwing out some more stuff for you in the future. Appreciate any support we get on the podcast with the shirts, whatever it may be. We really do. DSGN5 as well for five bucks off your first order. There you go. Jack saving you money across the freaking world in Australia. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but Jack, we are talking Spencer Dinwiddie, Jared Allen today. Are you excited? I'm all about it, Nick. I love doing these player review series. Uh, let's get started with Spencer. You know, we'll take a quick review of last season. If you could sum it up, Jack, what would it be for Spencer Dinwiddie last year? I think it was the season where Spencer Dinwiddie elevated himself even further, took that next step. You know, we sort of, it was the coming out party of the season before in 2017-18, 2018-19. Dinwiddie solidified himself as, you know, a, a fringe all-star player, one of the top guards in the league, uh, and a league driver, probably the best in that sort of range. And a guy who sort of solidified himself as a, as a long-term player in this league and and really important to the, to the Brooklyn Nets system. He was... Awesome across the board. Um, you know, sixteen point eight point forty rebounds, four point six assists, shooting over forty four percent from the field, nearly thirty four percent from three, and a really, really positive eighty one percent for the free throw line. He was just super, super duper important. Um, I remember, you know, talking about all season uh, in my preseason prediction that he won't get that six man of the year. You know, if he had have played eighty two games. Maybe he didn't seal it off Lou Will, but I think he would have made that race a little bit closer and he would have at least got voted in. Um, but he had such a tremendous season and he was super important to, to all the Brooklyn Nets' success. Yeah, and I mean, if he doesn't get hurt with that hand injury, he was playing some excellent ball in December and then in January it started to bother him. If he doesn't get hurt, you know, you mentioned, you know, fringe all-star. He might have prevented D'Angelo from being an all-star because they almost would have fought for votes. And then if you look at in the six-man race, I think it would have been right up there. I think he probably could have stole it from Lou Will or he would have probably finished number two because that's how good he was this year. You mentioned the driving was amazing. Then also the clutch moments. Just, you know, last year he had a couple clutch moments, but this season it felt like he had even more. Was and, and I mean, that goes to my favorite moments, Nick. The, the two for me were that Houston clutch pull up three um, was just, uh, and you sort of know when Spencer's taken them. And it, it can almost be when we get to his strengths and weaknesses, uh, a little bit of a weakness of his, because if it's not the right time or place or it's just a, a bad shot, it can sort of be a bad shot. But also that sidestep three over the, the massive center in Andre Drummond to get us to win as well. So, you know, he came up big. He came up clutch. He did it for us in 2017-18 as well. So he just added to his uh, long list of clutch moments as a Brooklyn Net. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned some of the clutch moments. Obviously, Houston really stuck out. That was just like kind of put the team on my back. You know, D'Angelo wasn't having the best game. But then also something that really stuck out was you mentioned the three against the Detroit, but also the defense I think he had in the next possession on yeah. Blake Griffin that yeah. kind of sealed the deal, and that went up in Barclays Center. So that was huge. Then I also liked uh, game one from him in the playoffs. I thought it was really good. Then um, – I'm not sure exactly what month it was, but I know he had a career game against the Sixers where he was just murdering them. Yeah, and then it's sort of why he played well in the playoffs, but it's also, you know, the Sixers don't necessarily have the sort of, we showed the, the the blueprint how we could beat them. And, you know, Spencer is such a huge part of that because he's crafty, he's quick, he can get to the rim. And as good as Joel Embiid is, you have shooters on the floor and you drag pain. You know, even if he's in the paint, he, he's obviously an all-defensive player on, the, on that second team being announced this week. But Spencer Dimon and Carol Savert still had really strong moments against him. And, you know, we're able to finish over him, under him, through him. Um, he, he's probably one of the best, you know, under him defenders in the league. But the fact that Spencer and Karras could still do their thing just shows how, you know, adept they are when they finishing around. Now, Jack, do you think this year he got to the free throw line more because of himself or was it more respect from the refs after kind of establishing himself last year or a combination of both? I think that he got himself to the rim through his play and then, you know, you sort of force the refs to, to make the whistle, you know, because you're under, you're in that area so often that generally that's where the whistle gets called the most. You know, unless you're James Harden and you're doing pull-up threes and trying to get the contact in that way, the more traditional way and the more, you know, <laughs> visually pleasing way <laughs> is how Spencer and Karras do it, you know. And a, a lot of the time, you know, Spencer will probably argue a, a little bit too much. But I think, you know, around the league, he probably got the most and one, you know, free throws um, sort of plays, you know, out of maybe any guard. Uh, I would have to certainly look into that a little bit more. But he was just uh, driving like a madman. And 
he he just played the angles in, in such a really positive way. You could just see the amount of work that he'd done and, you know, that probably with his trainers and with some of the assistant coaches, finishing through contact, finishing around contact, you know, going around the rim, you know, finishing uh, in, in left hand and right hand. Um, he was just tremendous. And, you know, he sort of forced the, the, the refs to sort of play it to him. And then, you know, I think that he developed a bit of more of a, a reputation like the net sort of did overall. You know, the fact that, you know, we're actually you know, a team to be watching, a team on the rise. And Spencer was probably, you know, heading that and sort of allowed us to gain that respect along the way. Yeah, and you mentioned using the angles, and that's one thing that really stuck out for me. I know we're not talking about improvements, but I just want to touch on that. He's so quick, he can get that step, and you realize even if someone's a little bigger than him, if he's able to get on the glass before they're able to get up, it's going to be a goaltend. And I thought he did an excellent job of that, especially using the scoop layup. Ryan Ruka would call it, you know, carrying a pizza or whatever it was. So uh, that was really impressive. But what do you think was the ideal lineup or the ideal lineup moving forward for Dinwiddie? Yeah, I think it was. It's almost nearly the same as Karis Levert. You know, I think literally. <laughs> I was thinking you, that too when we always were doing the notes. I was like, yeah, it's like we've had like almost the same lineups for all the guys we've done. And I think that that's almost a positive thing in the fact that this core is sort of, you know, Spencer's locked up for a little while longer. D'Angelo, hopefully, despite the fact that um, Bill Simmons doesn't think so, but we'll chat about that on a free agency pod. Um, D'Angelo, Russell, Joe Harris, uh, a better wing. You know, whether you add a Morris, a Randall, I'm not a bit as big on a Randall, but like a wing who can shoot a little bit, despite the fact that Julius Randall has been shooting some threes in the offseason. Um, and Jared Allen, because, you know, he's the center that you need in this pick and roll play, but, you know, hopefully upgraded Jared Allen um, with, you know, just a bit more aggression and a guy who could defend a little bit better in the post. Yeah, just more physicality, but I agree. I think you want the spacing out there, like you said, kind of similar to the other guys, and you want that pick-and-roll partner. And I think even if it wasn't a pick-and-roll partner, it was a pick-and-pop guy too, I think uh, Spencer could really use that too because all he really needs is someone to get the big out of position and allow him to use his speed. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that benefits um, Spencer, Karras uh, especially. So um, I think that those guys will only benefit greatly as, as we continue to, to look at add more talent uh, around the fringes. Yeah, and I think uh, moving forward, I know you probably saw the video of D'Angelo working working on the catch-and-shoot opportunities. I think, you know, this is not about him, but I think he could play better with Spencer if he's better on the catch-and-shoot, and I think he could play better with Karras if he's better on the catch-and-shoot too. So something to keep an eye on too with this, you know, backcourt that we have of three probably starting-level guards. Yeah, three starting little guards. I don't think that there is a better guard trio in the league. And I think that if you have them locked together, and you know, obviously th they might not be locked together. Who knows what can happen in free agency or, or through trade. But you need to exploit that strength to the best of your ability. You know, in, in a way that we did against the Sixers, apply to your strengths. Don't cater to the other team and try to t change your game. I know that... Greg Popovich says throughout the 82-game regular season, they don't worry about the other team. They focus on what they need to do. And when the scouting really comes in, the playoffs, we have to really hone in on another team. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's 82 games of the season. You can only focus so much on so much videotape on another team. Whereas focusing on your own sort of level, how you can beat the other team, how you can exploit your strengths, you know, nullify your weaknesses, I think is more important. Yeah, especially if you have like four games in six days or something, you're not getting much practice time to really focus on stuff like that. But Jack, do you think moving forward, hypothetically, if D'Angelo is retained, that we'll see more of the three-guard lineup of D'Angelo, Karras, and Spencer? Maybe not as much in the regular season, but moving forward in the postseason? Yeah, I think we will, Nick. I think that it was because of the health of a lot of these guys um, and, and, and general timing, we weren't able to see a lot of it. You know, I think early in the season, there were moments and, you know, there was some positive and negatives to it. But I think that when you develop, you know, any sort of on-court chemistry, no matter who it is, and obviously, you know, Karras is the likely three there. All the guys need the ball in their hands. But at the same time, you know, like you sort of was, were alluding to with D'Angelo playing a little bit off the ball, um, we know that he, his strength is shooting, you know, from literally any spot on the floor from the mid-range to three. And Spencer can do that as well. Um, obviously, Karras, is that, that's one thing that he might need to work on a little bit in the offseason, as we spoke about in, in his player review. But I think that all those guys have the chemistry, have the sort of knowledge of each other's games, um, and, and have the, just the desire to just uh, get the most out of each other. You know, I think that they're generally 
pretty selfless sort of guys. Obviously, there is an individual need to, you know, get your own shots and, and pad your stats to an extent. But I think all of these guys value winning over that. And I think that in the off-season, pre-season games and then sort of early season games, you'll probably see it a little bit more. Obviously, it could depend on who we have. You know, if we add a Jimmy Butler or Tobias Harris, how much does that affect things? I don't think you can have necessarily Jimmy Butler or Karis LeVert playing at the fall, though I do remember... Jared Dudley, you know, making some passing comments about Carol Savert, if he were to grow a little bit, he could easily play that four position. And I think, you know, having just a versatility in your positions and, and that positional versatility allows you to throw lineups out there that can be, you know, a little bit crazy, a little bit positive. But in the offseason and in the postseason, that's when you need that sort of versatility. You know, you're playing those extra bigs, you know, you throw the sort of game plan at the window and you do just what works best for you. And um, I think that those are our three best players. And Coach Kenny needs to, and the front office need to work the best way that they can to to get the most out of these three really talented young players. I agree. And I think one thing they all could do to benefit each other would be quicker with the decision making. You know, when the other one's out there and, you know, they're passing it out to the three point line, make a quicker decision. Are you going to shoot, pass, or drive? I'd like to see them drive a little bit more right off the initial pass. And I think they have the ability to do that. But sometimes it's like they take a pause and they kind of blow the opportunity. And I think that's something they'll learn more playing together. Yeah, and I think for the most part, we are quite good in our decision-making. You know, when you've watched the Nets play basketball, it's not a Houston Rockets-style thing where it takes eight seconds to get into any sort of play. The Nets are pretty sort of purposeful in, you know, getting the ball up, and getting the high pick and roll going, trying to get some sort of movement, trying to get some sort of space, um, and, and getting into our sort of play and offense quite early. Uh, but I, I get what you're sort of saying. You know, D'Angelo Russell can be a guy who can sort of labor a little bit. Spencer likes to sort of carry the ball up a little bit. But I think... You know, it depends on you know, the, obviously the style and timing of the of, of play, but I think for the most part of this season, when you know we were able to watch them, you know, pretty consistently, the Nets were pretty good at getting into their sets pretty, at a pretty reasonable rate. Yeah, and I'm not as much talking about the sets. I'm talking more so on like a kick out. You know, you get it kicked out to you like boom. And this maybe isn't as much on Karis. It's kind of more of like a Dinwiddie and D'Angelo thing where they, like you said, they like to kind of take the ball, take their time sometime, isolate the guy, where sometimes it just makes more sense to take advantage of this space that you have, especially with the defense recovering, you just go straight to the rim. Yeah, I think D'Angelo's probably a guy that could have done that a little bit more. I think that he likes to do the sort of half pump fake, but he doesn't have any real lateral quickness. So I'd rather him, like you sort of said, make that decision and, and put it up. He's got a bit of size in him. So unless the defender closing out on him has an extra few inches, but you know we know the arc on his shot and we saw it in that video and that was just a, <laughs> a, a gorgeous video, some of the rainbow shots there. Um, but yeah, I think that just having that purpose, having that sort of you know set mindset, um, and just, you know, getting, going to take that shot. I'm going to take this shot or I'm going to drive it here. Um, I, I think it can benefit any sort of guy. Yeah, perfect word, purpose. You know, purpose with aggression. I think that's what they need. Just a touch more and they'll benefit from each other. But talking, staying on Dinwiddie, what are some of the biggest improvements you saw from this year? Yeah, driving like a madman, as he always <laughs> like does. That. You know, he just finishing with the and one, finishing around the rim. You know, like we sort of spoke about um, points per shot attempt. You know, he was really, really positive in that sort of department. Um, and as well, just being able to take those pull-up threes. Um, there weren't many guys in the league, you know, unless you're talking about a guy like Damian Lillard and Stephen Curry, who could just take those deep threes and it's just like, this is a bad shot. But then it's like, it makes it, it's a good shot. Um, yeah, so I think Spencer did when he, just in general in those sort of departments. And then at times throughout the season, he showed some real nice defensive acumen. But for me, uh, you can almost see it as a weakness because if he showed it uh, on certain points, like he was sort of speaking about with Blake Griffin and, and other points of the season, why couldn't he show it for a, for a fuller extent? Obviously, does the injury affect that? Does the, the offensive burden affect that? Um, I, I think it's a, a little bit of both. But you, know, you see Kawhi Leonard right now doing absolutely everything on both ends of the floor, stopping the 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 beast, the Greek freak, got length uh, in a guy like Giannis Antetokounmpo, but then also contributing at an absolutely MVP level on the other end of the floor. That's what that's what's asked of your stars. And I think that Spencer Dinwiddie going forward, it's going to be asked more of him on the defensive end. Yeah, and, you know, actually when we were watching game one together, Jack, we kind of mentioned that and we were just like chit-chatting that, you know, he played such a great game defensively, it would almost annoy you over your Atkinson because you're like, where was this all season long? You know, like it's just kind of bring that same energy all the time. I get the playoffs different intensity, but I think that's an area he can definitely improve. But on areas he improved, like you mentioned, you know, driving was really good. Like I was at a point in the season where it felt like he could literally drive on everybody. 
I also thought his uh, his three point shot was better than the stats say. I feel like when he came yeah. back from injury, it just wasn't as consistent. But you know, you have a hand injury that's going to happen. You mentioned the free throw attempts, and I felt like there was less bad shots. There definitely was still some, but the season prior, there was definitely more. Yeah, and I mentioned the the points per shot attempt. He was in the ninety first percentile um, in that sort of range on, for, via cleaning the glass. So a hundred, nearly one hundred eighteen points per hundred shot attempts. So that's elite level, and obviously that takes into account you know getting to the line as well. So guys like him, James Harden, Giannis, that are just efficient in their offense and play efficient basketball can take threes. Um, it just it's reflected in that, and you know the the prior season he was he was barely in the fiftieth percentile. Um, and in these first two seasons in the league, he was in the first and eighth percentile. So, so to take such a massive jump um, shows the the real improvement in his game, you know, on a on a statistical sort of level. And honestly, I think, and I'm going to keep harping on this. I feel like if he didn't have the hand injury, his season would have been even better, and we would be talking about more improvements. But I feel like that injury, especially your hand, and then coming back after D'Angelo was really hot, and then Karis LeVert coming back around the same time, it kind of messed him up and kind of took him out of his groove a little bit. Well, like, yeah, if you look at the sort of splits across the months, you know, across March, he didn't have a, a really good March at all, you know, didn't shoot 40% from the field, shot under 30% from three. But you look at October and November and, and, and even December, you know, in those first few games of the season, he was shooting nearly 44% from three, you know, uh, and also for, nearly 50% from the field. So I think those splits month by month show a sort of uh, paint a bigger picture and a better picture of how sort of Spencer was throughout the season, you know, where the injury sort of affected him because, you know, in March when he came back, that obviously it's where he did sort of tend to struggle because he was out for generally pretty much the whole month of February and and late January. Yeah, and I feel like you definitely could see with the three-point shooting and the stats you said, you mentioned really stick that out. But what are some areas we want to see him improve? We mentioned the defense being more consistent, but what else would you like to see? Yeah, I think in general, his shot selection can still be a little bit frustrating. Um, but I think for the most part, when you have that confidence in yourself, you know, you have to live with the bad shots every now and then, you know, I think that's the same with the Angela Russell. Um, but I think, you know, cutting those out, uh, or at least, you know, not necessarily take them in the, the first four seconds, five seconds of a shot clock. You know, if it, if it's a bailout shot or if it's like five seconds left and, you know, you've got to take that deep three and, and that sidestep three, do it. But if it's at the start of a shot clock, unless there's sort of, you know, you're trying to get a, a an N one or just an, an extra possession uh, towards the end of a, a quarter, you know, I think that that's one area that he can easily sort of fix up. I think he's rebounding. Um, he can get a little bit better at I think, in general, our guards are, are quite good rebounders, and they've got size, Karras and, and DeAndre are a little bit taller, a little bit stronger. Spencer obviously isn't short by any set, stretch of the imagination as well. He's a six foot six guy. You know, that's a guy that, that, play, that plays the two and, and probably even the three in this, this current league. So I think he can improve that department a little bit, and obviously, allows him to get out and transition a little bit. You know, run the ball a little bit in the floor, in the open floor. Uh, and I think that one season he dropped off this season was his turnover percentage. Um, you know, according to cleaning the glass, you know, last season he was in the 85th percentile, you know, only 10% uh, of his possessions did he turn over the ball. Whereas this season that, cri- that climbed up to 12.3%, which is only in the 46th percentile. So um, obviously his game changed. We asked a different of him, but, you know, you can sort of try and maintain. Uh, we weren't necessarily expecting the turnover ratio from last season that was Chris Paul level. Um, but you would want to sort of maintain a semblance of a consistency. But when you're taking more shots on the offensive end and it's a different style of game, you're going to see some sort of drop off. Yeah, and I feel like his role adjusted a little bit too, going from being the starter most the majority of last season to this year, being kind of a backup and them asking him to be more of a scoring punch than maybe as much as a true point guard. But you mentioned the rebounding. That's something that's always stuck out with Spencer. I almost feel like he doesn't like going in there because he's scared to get hurt or something because he usually, if you watch him on defensive possessions, he's hardly ever in the paint going for a rebound. He's usually out where the three-point line. And you mentioned also the fast break. I think that's an area where he can capitalize on his speed. And I feel like he doesn't. I don't know if it's his you know, lack of confidence, dribbling in transition, but whatever it may be, I think that's an area he can really attack. And in general, if you aren't getting the rebound, you can't really attack in transition. You know, Ben Simmons, uh, Kara Silvert, you know, um, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LeBron James, Draymond. those guys, Draymond, those guys hunt the rebound so that they can really push the pace. And I think that Spencer sort of, you know, hangs a little bit. He'll sort of be the guy next to Jared Allen or the guy next to uh, Ed Davis. So then he could sort of, push it up a little bit um i think a little bit more aggression in there you know rise that number 
maybe from two and a half to, to four or three and a half. Um, it doesn't, it's not necessarily the numbers. It's more the, the direction and, and, and the opportunities that he can sort of give the offense like you sort of spoke about. Yeah, I agree. It's just like the activity. And another area I'd like to see him improve, I think, off-ball movement. You know, this is when he's playing with the other guard. You see a, typically a lot, he just kind of steps to the wing and provides spacing. But we talked about how quick he is. I think a little bit more off-ball movement. Some of that's on Kenny, maybe calling a play for him or putting something in the playbook. Take advantage of his catch and shoots and just get him more active out there, especially if you're moving forward, playing Karras and D'Lo and him more together. Yeah, I think that there needs to be more plays for the team in general rather than specific players because you see the off-ball movement from Joe Harris. But it's generally Joe, Joe Harris and Rodion's and then uh, some other guys sort of Crab standing around, m- yeah, m- moving a little bit. Um, but then, you know, you would rather see that, you know, just constant motion from all players. You know, I think it makes it a lot easier when you have Stephen Curry and Clay Thompson on your team. Um, and, you know, that Stephen Curry video is like one of the funniest things ever. Um, <laughs> but when you just have constant movement, you know, ball movement, player movement, uh, I think we speak about it at length just in terms of general basketball philosophy. You can't guard it. When you, you're sitting screens, you know, off-ball screens, uh, it just makes things, it gets you open shots, gives you open lanes, gives you open space. Um, and I think in general that can really, you know, help our offense in a positive fashion. If you add a guy, you know, it, with, with some real talent on it as well, the defense is going to be gravitated towards him in, in such a real way. You know, if you add Jimmy Butler and then, you know, you've got Spencer Dinwiddie and Karis Levert or Spencer and DeAnza out there, then, you know, you, you've got the second or third best defender on two really, really talented guys that can really punish those sort of, uh, that sort of level of, of defense. So uh, I think that there should be um, some work in the off season. But it's always like we sort of speak about. It's going to depend on how things work out. But yeah, those improvements can certainly made from from Spencer. Yeah, and like you mentioned, not everybody has Steph and Clay, but the fact is they keep defenses busy. You know, you have to worry about them running off screens, setting screens, and then they're just a step late when it comes to help. And that's one thing I love about watching Golden State. Obviously, they have extremely talented players, but I love the way their offense works. It just keeps the defense so active. It's like you turn your head for a second, somebody might have an open three or somebody else has an open layup. Yeah, easily. And I think that that's all about, you know, philosophies. You know, Steve Kerr's been doing this for nearly five seasons now with with the, and it took a while to sort of set that sort of uh, play, those plays in motion and, and obviously the knowledge of it and, and, and the trust in it. But I think, you know, Coach Kenny's already developed a, a, a high level of trust with his players. Obviously, you know, around the league, he's got plenty of respect as well how the other players sort of view him, you know, with, with new guys that come in in free agency will be interesting. But, you know, obviously he has a, a really positive reputation. Um, so I think that in the off season, you know, we spoke about, you know, defense being the, the real sort of focus, forcing turnovers. You know, we improved in that department and we had a better defensive rating than offensive rating. So I think that we've got more offensive talent on our roster than defensive talent. So there's no reason why that we should be underperforming in that in that sort of respect. Yeah, and we mentioned offense too. I think transition offense area to pick up. And then one other side note on Dinwiddie. We saw this just a few times this year, and this is probably me nitpicking, but being one of the smartest players on the team, he made a couple mistakes late in game, either fouling or not fouling when he shouldn't have. One game, uh, it's, I can't recall the exact game, but there was a situation where he didn't need to foul, and he did, and then it ended up you know, killing the Nets. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And I think that... You know, players sort of lose their heads a little bit on the floor, but you expect more from Spencer. I think it was Portland. From... Portland yeah. sound right? Yeah, it's, uh, I th- it was at home, wasn't it? I think it was on the road. I th- it happened yeah. more than once. It happened more yeah. than once because I remember being like, yo, Dinwiddie, you're like the smartest dude on the team. What are you doing here? Yeah, and I mean, those sort of brain farts, for lack of a better word, happened throughout the season. And, you know, you see, you saw it in San Antonio uh, <laughs> in the playoffs as well. So it can certainly happen. But, you know, um, if you eradicate those completely, you know, we're not speaking about them. And uh, I mean, you spoke about transition offense, Nick. I think another sort of area to work on in the offseason for Spencer uh, is the mid range shot. You know, I think that it's obviously, it might seem sacrilege to the analytics department and, any Brooklyn Nets coach that's listening right now. <laughs> but I think that, you know, when it push comes to shove, you need to just have a, a wide array, a wide array of shot selection and, and, and offensive uh, weapons in your arsenal. Um, you look at sort of James Harden in this postseason, you know, he'd be looking and hunting the three point shot or hunting to get to the line. And he would have open mid range shots. And most NBA players can hit it. We know D'Angelo can hit it. Um, and it's not necessarily you want Spencer to turn into D'Angelo, 
But if it's open there and you can get an easy two points, we know that Spencer can use the glass really well and is good from around that sort of five to eight foot range. But, you know, from eight to like 15 feet, eight to like 18 feet, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that I want to see it from him consistently because he does take, he has a very sort of offensively pleasing and analytically ple- analytically pleasing style of play. But just to have those shots and, and if, if a defense is collapsing on you and giving that sort of space, then just take the shot. Yeah, I agree. I think even if it's somewhat of like a push shot to a teardrop, just because of the aggression he plays with, he's kind of more downhill than like a step back on the mid range. So like just something in that in-between area. And I think that would be the next step in his offensive game where he'd be extremely difficult to defend. Yeah, exactly. And I think that you add anything. Um, and I think that these guys just work so hard in the off season and, you know, you're spending, you know, six months or so, five to six months, just playing basketball and, and honing areas of your game, be it your strengths or weaknesses, um, that they're going to get better. Um, you know, we, we saw the massive rise in, in literally the three players that we've spoken about so far. So um, I expect Spencer to get even better heading into 2019-20. Yeah, I'm really intrigued. Obviously, 20 he's, I believe, 25 right now, going to be turning 26. What kind of jump can he make? How much better can he get offensively, defensively? Really intriguing. And I think being such a smart player, I think he's self-aware and understanding where he needs to work on. But, Jack, where does he rank in terms of the NBA at his position? Yeah, I mean, we spoke about D'Angelo Russell sort of pushing that top 10. So I think that you could almost you know say that Spence is probably in that department as well. He's easily in the top half of of guard of point guards in the NBA. Um and probably the best guard coming off the bench with Lou Williams. Yeah. But I would rather have I mean it, I'm biased, but I'd rather <laughs> have Spencer Dimwitty because um despite the fact that Lou Will showed some really nice passing acumen um in this postseason, Spencer has a more well rounded game. Whereas I guess if you're looking at sort of areas and, and facets of the game, Lou Williams can get absolutely cooked on the defensive end. Spencer, not so much. Um, but Lou Williams has such tremendous offensive talents that does that make up for it? Yeah, probably. So um, obviously I'm going to be biased in that department. But you know, him and him and Lou Will uh, are going to so- have already solidified themselves. I mean, Lou Will, you might as well have the award named after him. But you know, Spencer did when he, if he plays the similar role in, in going forward, then I think he can probably be, you know, another six man of the year contender heading into next season. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, top 15, top 20 point guard, you know, a lot of it depends on opportunity. But like I said, I'll keep harping on it. The way he played in the beginning of the season really stuck out to me. And I think he's probably the top backup point guard in the league. You know, if not number one, he's top three. And you mentioned Lou Will, you know, probably a little bit of apples and oranges because I think Dinwiddie does a better job of running the offense where Lou Will's main focus is just going out there and scoring. You mentioned he did improve as a passer, but I think Dinwiddie overall, and like you mentioned too, the defense, like Dinwiddie, we talked about, he needs to improve in that area, but if he wants to be a good defender, he can be because of the skill set he has, the length and the the quickness. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, he sort of separated himself from the pack, you know, the likes of, you know, Terry Rogier, DJ Augustine, these sort of backup guys who, and I think DJ Augustine even started. Um, but at yeah. the same time, um, a guy like Malcolm Brogdon, who's, you know, off his postseason has been really impressive. That's the sort of, you know, mold that you want Spencer to almost be in. But I think Malcolm has, uh, uh, you know, incredible, you know, intelligence and had like a 50-40-90 season and can play some really good defense. But, you know, he's obviously asked a, a lot less of him you know, playing alongside a Giannis, whereas Spencer will obviously, you know, run the second unit um, quite uh, handsomely by himself, whereas, you know, Brogdon obviously works best when he's next to a really good player. So uh, it is apples and oranges in that sort of respect as well, Nick. But yeah, Spencer's by far probably the best backup point guard, but, you know, he's easily a, a starter. You know, if, if, if he were on the open market this offseason, guaranteed a team would offer him, you know, a $15 million per year deal, maybe even an $18 million per year deal if it's a, if it's a team that's pretty desperate, like, you know, a Phoenix Suns or, or, or another team in that department. Yeah, I agree. Especially if he were to have a season where he was a starting point guard for a team and he was able to showcase that work. You know, last year was his coming out party. This year was he was in the backup role. But if he hypothetically were to start the season, had a really big year, he could get a ton of money. But Jack, anything else you want to touch on and Dinwiddie? Well, I think in in the in that sort of respect, Nick, he started pretty much all of 2017, 18 when the, there was injuries that were forced upon him and sort of thrust but him into that role. I feel like that was more of like, all right, this is like his first year doing it. Where like if he started this year, yeah. his skill set he improved. So I feel like he's taken another step. And I think having where he started in 2017, 18, that team wasn't great. You know what I yeah, mean? That's, like, yeah, that's fair. 
that team was, you know, below average team. It wasn't a playoff team where this year, this is a playoff caliber team. You're starting with better players. And I even think that the Nets outperform their talent just because of coaching chemistry and whatever it may be. Yeah, I agree with that as well. But um, at the same time, Spencer closed pretty much all, if not, you know, probably 90, 80, 90 percent of of our games. And I think that that's just as important, if not more, when it comes to, um, you know, just being a, a really important player. 100 percent. And I do think he's important, but I'm just saying from a stati- statistical standpoint, if he yeah. were to play like 35 minutes or something, his numbers would probably shoot up. But anything else you wanted to touch on about Dinwiddie's season? No, nah, we'll get on to um, his big Afro friend. <laughs> And uh, obviously, that is Jared Allen. What did you think of his season? In a quick summary, I think that it was up and down. But if you're looking at it overall, that he improved, um, and and I think you can't deny that. You know, he improved as a rebounder, improved as a passer, improved, um, you know, scoring. Um, his free throw percentage, you know, dropped a little bit, and the three point shot certainly waned. But funnily enough, you know, his effective field goal percentage, you know, was still around that 60% mark. Um, you know, there were up and down moments, but, you know, he had a lot of double-doubles throughout the season. Um, I thought that it was an improved season for uh, for Jared Allen. But, you know, it was still, you know, like a lot of people were left a little bit underwhelmed by him. But he's still, you know, only a, a, he's, it's his 20-year-old season. He's only just turned 21. Um, so I think across the board, you know, to be a starting center on a playoff team, be only 21 years old, uh, I think that there aren't many guys in that league that could sort of say that. Yeah, and he had some really good moments in the playoffs. You know, he had some really bad moments, but I pretty much have the exact same thing as you, Jack, in my notes. I have another year improvement, but hot and cold moments throughout the season. Yeah, and I think that you're going to expect that from any young player, yep. not just a, a young big, you know. Donovan Mitchell started the season, you know, pretty poorly and then finished the season where some guys had him on their All-NBA ballots. Um You know, De'Aaron Fox, you know, similarly, uh, I think he was a bit more consistent throughout the season. But, you know, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, these sort of young players, anyone under 23, 24 years old who hasn't spent much time in the league, you know, is still finding their footing and and hasn't necessarily had that imprint yet. So um, not everyone can be Luka Doncic in this league. Not everyone can make that sort of, you know, footprint in in such a a positive and impactful way. Um, I think that... You know, Jared Allen's almost still like a project player in, in many respects. And I know that it's hard to sort of say that. And you want, you know, guys like, you know, Dwayne Dedman and and these sort of guys who can sort of be a bit more physical and more bullies and stuff. But it's like I, I, I'm much more, I'm much higher on the, on the potential that Jared Allen has, you know, when he's 25 years old, where he's going to be in this league. And uh, I think that at the same time, it's not necessarily a bad thing that he hasn't, you know, shot out of the garden and be such a an absolute stud on both ends of the floor because I think they can benefit the Nets in sort of the in terms of their contract sort of flexibility. You don't have to offer him, you know, twenty million dollars per year or at the end the Russell style max. You know, that money can be, you know, set aside for Karis Levert and other guys. So I think that in general, being the sort of fourth got fourth best guy on in a starting lineup. And, and sort of an ancillary piece, but also a guy who has flexibility and can switch on to guys, I think it's more important. Yeah, I do. I agree. I think there's plenty of room for improvement. And it just the way it fits with the Nets roster is ideal. And obviously, he's 21. He's been 21 for 33 days. So it's not like he, we're talking about an old player here. Like you said, he is almost still much of a project because – Coming in, you know, you and I, when we discussed him on the season preview, his rookie season, we didn't necessarily expect him to play a ton in the beginning of the year. He ended up starting, I think, in February, and then he finished pretty strong. So I think it's just kind of take it take it as it is, and he's just going to keep getting better. And we know the biggest issue for him is size, and it's not like you're going to gain 40 pounds of muscle in one year. You know, it's going to take a lot of time, and you, as you get older, it's a little bit easier to do. So, And for what it's worth, I mean – in terms of offensive rating and defensive rating for guys that actually played on the Nets, he had the highest offensive rating at 123, and his defensive rating was 106. So I think the numbers help, you know, define his impact. Yeah, they really do. And, you know, for the most part, obviously, you know, you want him out there in the closing sort of moments of a game, but he's obviously going to get better um, in that sort of department. And I think in terms of the size thing, 
you can't get bigger during the, the regular season unless you are injured and, you know, you have maybe a soft tissue injury and you can, you know, work out your upper body in that sort of respect. But, um, you know, you can't work out in, in, in the offseason. The preseason is where you put on that muscle. You know, your diet sort of changes a little bit. You can sort of hone on on focusing and toning your body in a, in a positive way. So um, Jared Allen will obviously, he'll definitely put on some sort of way how noticeable it will be. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think that a, a guy's strength isn't defined by, you know, how big his muscles are. Um, you know, you look at Kyle Lowry, you know, one of the, the strongest guys in the league, Chris Paul, PJ Tucker. These guys are just absolute trucks. And I think you can show strength and you can, you know, if you're more intelligent and, and have a higher basketball IQ, you know, you can use your strengths to your advantage. Um, and I think that, you know, his athleticism is is the one strength that he has. And um, how he plays against a guy like Joel Embiid, who is going to be, you know, uh, the offensive and defensive juggernaut in, in the Eastern Conference for years to come, and in our same division as well, he's going to have to he's going to have to put up or shut up because you know this guy is an absolute monster, and unless injuries were to stop him, you know he's going to be versing him for plenty of years to come. Yeah, like you mentioned, take advantage of some of your other athletic gifts. You know, maybe your quickness, get better with your hands, kind of just play the mind game a little bit with them. You know, play a little aggressive you know, pull the chair out once in a while, whatever it may be. And some of that's just going to come with Jared Allen having more experience. Like he just seems like a guy that just needs to play more basketball. And Coach Kenny has mentioned he thinks that Jared Allen's going to be an elite center in two to three years. And that's pretty high praise coming from Kenny, who doesn't necessarily like, you know, blow his players up. He doesn't really. He's confident in his players. And, and you know, um, his his bud who we just spoke about, Spencer Dillon, he said he thinks he'll be a top five center in this league. Very high mark when we have, you know, the, the likes of Nikola Jokic, Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns, Joel Embiid uh, in this league. That's just four centers off the top of my head. You, yeah. know, you had a guy like Miles Turner who is, you know, was unlucky to be snubbed in the all-defensive teams too. But, you know, Jared Shout Allen... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Jared Allen still has plenty, plenty of room to grow. And I think that that's, those are the areas uh, that make us so high on him. And also, for a lot of fans, probably frustrate them because they know what he can be. But I think you need to have a little bit of patience. And, and obviously, it's hard being a fan. You know, um, the, the, the general definition of fan is fanatic. So you, you have that sort of irrational sort of expectations for, for guys that you love. And, you know, Jared Allen, I think we're just going to continue showing patience with him. And if he can continue to improve steadily, you know, there'll be up and down moments. But um, we want him to just continue to show growth. Yeah, and I think another positive from the season two is his stroke looks pretty good. I mean, it still needs a little bit of work, but I think overall you feel like there is a possibility of him developing a somewhat consistent three-point shot in the future. I think he needs to just be confident taking it. And sure. like, if it's if it's bad, it's bad. You know, Giannis isn't a good three-point shooter, but he's taking them. And he I makes it look that, like sometimes he is. Like the way he just goes up and just drops it. It's like, okay, Giannis, you felt like you were hitting that, huh? Yeah, if you're hanging out on the corner, take it immediately. You know, show that just, it, just the, the, we sort of spoke about purpose and decision-making with our guards. You know, if Jared Allen's out there, and I think he spoke about it in, in his um, off-season interviews, his post-season interviews, that he he's going to be working on it. So obviously it's going to be reps, but reps only mean so much when you're versing a chair and, and, a, and a trainer. You know, when you're coming up against, you know, NBA level guys, you know, he's obviously massive, six foot 11. So he can shoot over literally everyone. And, you know, there aren't going to be many centers that are going to close out on him. So just take the bloody shot. Um, and I think that if you miss it, you miss it. But if you continue to take it, don't worry about the percentages. You know, Yana shot like 30% on the season. And then towards the end of the season, when he was taking them a little bit more, you know, he started to shoot a little bit better in, in, in the month of February, March. So I think he just needs to take them because early in the season, you know, he was like, oh, okay, well, then Jared Allen looks okay. But then towards the end of the season, he just like seemed to actively avoid it. Um, so I think it's just going to be about mindset. And I think a lot of Jared Allen's game and his general impact is about mindset. Yeah, and I agree. I think he seemed more aggressive shooting the threes early in the year. I think in the opening game of the season, we saw him shoot three or four and knock down two. So, and then kind of as the year progressed, he got a little bit of shy around the three point line. But talking about favorite moments, and you talked about his attitude and aggression. One game that really stuck out for me was that Hawks game. I want to say like John Collins like pushed him or somebody, or maybe it was like Torian Prince or something. They got him angry in like the first two minutes of the game. And I felt like that was one of his best games of the season. Yeah, and it's it's not like it should take that, but I think just general mentality and general human nature is that you're going to be like, oh, well, I'm going to want to get this guy back in, in a certain sort of respect. And, you know, he did show more aggression, you know, in terms of finishing and with these dunks and such, you know, there were a lot of times where 
you know, he was just, you know, a, a touch off in, in his rookie season. Whereas this season, you know, what, be it blocking, be it, you know, defensive timing, I think that he showed a, a lot of growth in that department. I think that uh, Nets fans should be happy with that. Yeah, I agree. And Jack, what were some other favorite moments for Jared Allen for you this year? Uh, for me, it was probably that my top moment was probably that 2020 game uh, against Houston. He was just huge wow. in that game. Absolutely dominant. And, you know, when you're a big man, the sort of 2020 is sort of like a a mark of honor, a sort of badge of honor in, in many ways because, you know, it shows how much you've impacted the game and, you know, on both ends of the floor. And he was just, you know, um, really just a, an absolute force. And then, um, I mean, you can list the blocks. Um, it, he was he was you like with the list of, of names that he kept on adding <laughs> like and, 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 de- and destroying along the way. But, I mean, the favorite is obviously LeBron, but... I think um, early in the season, when he blocked Blake and then he blocked him again, I was just like, man, this dude's something else. And um, shout out to Knicks fans out there. You know, Mitchell Robinson's pretty cool too, um, but Jared Allen ain't too bad. Yeah, I think um, I think the hardest block he had, you know, like the LeBron one really sticks out. But blocking Giannis on a dunk attempt seems almost impossible with his length. And he was able to do that this year. And I was like, okay, that's that's like you can block any player in the league. And we saw him in person block Anthony Davis twice. They weren't yeah. dunk attempts, but it was still like, okay, you can block two of the best athletes and longest players. Like, there's not many players you can't block. Yeah, no. I mean, I'd, it would take some incredible research. And if there's, I'm sure that there might be some listeners that know more than me, but I guarantee there won't be many players in this league who in the same season blocked Anthony Davis, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and LeBron James. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, you, it would take some incredible amounts of research, and I think our listeners are a lot smarter than I am. Um, so let me know, you know, sign to the DMs at the JMAJBT. But, you know, just tremendous in that sort of department and, you know, uh, helped us sort of grow uh, a, a stature and some respect around the league and, and a bit more attention that um, we certainly deserve. Yeah, and I feel like it helped the Nets defensively because he became a presence because people were like, oh, well, he just blocked LeBron. Oh, he blocked Giannis. Like, I'm going to think about going inside against him. And I feel like that helped his game because I think, you know, your mentality defensively or offensively when you're attacking the paint, you know, when you play Utah, like go Bears in there. How many layups am I going to get? Jared Allen's trying to build up like that. He's not really go bear yet, but that's kind of where the goal is. Yeah, I mean, I am I wanted to be Miles Turner first because I think Miles Turner's got a little more – uh spring and lateral quickness can shoot the three um i want him to be miles turner and if he can turn into miles turner in any sort of respect then i'm going to be tremendously happy Corey's got himself one in there in indiana but um you know it's still early days for jared allen in his career but um what's your ideal lineup for him uh my friend yeah i mean i think his ideal lineup is playing with a playmaking guard and then, you know, spacing on the outside so he can really act, be active inside and catch those, you know, rolls to the rim, get those easy shots, dunks, whatever it may be. I think, you know, all the players on the roster that we talked about all benefit from spacing, and that includes his centers. And obviously, he's not going to make plays for himself, so he needs someone to make plays for him. Yeah, and he got better as a passer, as a kick-out passer. Yep. So if there are the three-point shooters there, Joe Harris, Alan Crabb, however much longer, you know, Spencer Dimity can shoot the three, D'Angelo can shoot the three, Harris can shoot the three pretty well. Um, but, you know, we sort of spoke about, you know, if we were speaking about 2017-18, we probably would have said Karis LeVert is that one sort of guy that you want him to be next to because they had such good chemistry. But then D'Angelo developed that with him. And then Spencer has. Uh, I think he's got chemistry with all of our our young, really um, positive guys. All of them can pass. And all of them have different sort of ways to pass. You know, there were plenty of oops uh, that he finished off D'Angelo, off Spencer. And then there's those wraparound passes down low that just Jared Allen knows where Karis is going to be. So uh, I think that any of those guards you know Jared Allen's obviously going to benefit from and he can give him those space because I think he got better as a screener in terms of you know the strengths and weaknesses yeah and I think uh, Joe Harris actually had some nice chemistry with Jared Allen this year you know where yeah. he was driving to the rim a little bit it wasn't you know the most consistent thing but there was points where he was hitting him with a wraparound pass I think Jared Allen and we're kind of moving on to strengths right now is he improved in understanding where he needs to be offensively into the open space where he can get hit with a pass yeah, I, I mean, in similarly, Nick, I had, you know, he had some really nice soft touch in the pick and roll. Um, he had cleaner hands, his athleticism, um, his ambidexterity. You know, he mm. finished with both right and left hands. Not many guys. I felt I mean, like that's he was almost better with his left at certain points during the year. Yeah, 
Yeah, especially, you know, backing guys down. Um, and I think he really improved as a screener. I think Ed Davis really helped him there. He did improve as a rebounder, but it's certainly one area that he can get better at. And then I think his strength as well, just off the basketball court. He's just an awesome dude. Mm. Just a really, really nice guy. Um, and I think that we need to sort of um, treat these guys, you know, not just as basketballers, but as human beings. And I think Jared Allen deserves the utmost respect for a guy who's, you know, a 21-year-old kid that has the maturity level of, you know, a high maturity level than I'll ever have and a much greater impact on, on the, the, the Nets community and the wider community. Um, just a really great guy. And um, we're, we're lucky to have a, a guy with such great character on this Nets organization. It is incredible being 21 years old and he was doing this since his rookie season, having an impact in the community is just awesome. Like he's done so many different things already. And I love that the fact that the Nets kind of showcased it. And I think he was up for some type of community award in terms of the NBA this year for the work he did. So I'm really happy having a player like that on and off the court. Yeah, I mean, it just... It, it, it gravitates you, it, it draws you towards this team more. It, it, it allows you to, it's, and it sort of sets a, an example and you know, to have those role models on your team. You know, I, I think character, you know, I think more than anything, we don't care like how good of basketball you are. Well, obviously it's huge, but uh, I think that we, we think of these guys too much as robots, basketball, basketball, basketball. But if you're a good person, then I think that that speaks just as greatly. And I think that as much as we are a basketball podcast, we are a Brooklyn Nets podcast. Jared Allen is a great dude. And this is a team full of good dudes. And um, I think that, you know, having high character guys, um, I think is something that the Nets organization values. And um, we've got a dime in, in Jared Allen. Yeah, 100%. I think it helps build a culture in the organization just having guys like that. And I think that's why, you know, Kenny might kind of, you know, praise him a little bit more because of the things that he does and that he's very coachable as well. And just to, uh, you know, point out one more thing I felt like he improved in, I felt like his help defense was better this year. He was quicker in reacting to what the offense was trying to do. And I think a lot of fans were upset that like, oh, Jared Allen's getting abused by these centers. A lot of it was he was helping out the guards and the wings so much defending their guy. Nobody else had his back. And obviously it's a lot to ask him to recover when he doesn't have the physical strength to kind of stop somebody when they're already gaining momentum. If it's a Joel Embiid or even if it's a JaVale McGee. Yeah, I think his awareness got uh, a, a lot better. And I think that that just comes with time on the floor. And like we yep. sort of mentioned, um, the more time he spends on a basketball floor against uh, elite level talent, he is a starter. So he's going to come up against the, the best guards, the best wings and the best centers in the league. Um, and he's now had a full season against these sort of guys, um, against the sort of starters. So he knows the strengths and weaknesses. He's a very intelligent guy. So um, it's all about sort of improving him individually. Now he's got that knowledge base um, and obviously he's got great teammates around him and great coaches. So um, I think that the improvements we'll see will only be more and more throughout his career. Yeah, and I feel like you start to get a better feel for the NBA in terms of players. Obviously, you watch them on TV, but playing against them, you kind of learn their strengths and weaknesses. And talking about weaknesses, what are areas he needs to improve this year other than adding muscle and strength? That's the obvious one. Yeah, I think that that's uh, a pretty obvious one, Nick. But, you know, I, I think that that's one that's just going to happen with time. <laughs> um, I think just rebounding in general, I, I think that um, we just want you want your big to be in those sort of, you know, at least nine or 10 rebounds a game. Um, and I think that obviously Jared Allen can use his athleticism in a way where he can do that. And I think he really did improve as a rebounder, but I think it's still an area that he can continue to grow. You know, there were nights where he had, you know, two or three rebounds and some of those nights were throughout the playoffs. So I think, you know, rebounding consistency is an area that he can sort of focus on. Um, post defense, you know, I think that that'll come with strength and such and against guys like Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid, um, all these sort of guys who are the best centers in the league, you're going to have to improve in that area because, you know, or else they're going to, you're going to get eaten up in there. You know, we saw throughout the season, his canter had his, had his lunch a, a few times. Um, Three-point shooting as well. You know, you sort of t spoke about Nick and at the start of the season where he, he seemed ready, he seemed purposeful out of the sort of area, and then it sort of, you know, really went to the wayside. So I think consistency in that area, consistency across the board. And then um, I think he had a, a few too many turnovers for my liking. Mm. Um Gave the ball away, whether it was, you know, a bad pass to him. Um, but I think there were moments throughout the season where he would give the ball up uh, at a rate that I think was a, a, a bit too high for a big man. Um, and, and for a guy who doesn't have a high usage and is more there finishing the plays, you know, despite the fact that I think he got better as a passer, because the ball was in his hands a little bit more, he was a little bit careless at times. Or not, maybe not even careless, just wasn't smart enough and didn't execute well enough. 
Yeah, I agree. I think there was times where, you know, maybe it was a bad pass, but he tried to do too much with it instead of just collecting the ball and reestablishing the offense. And that's something he's going to learn. And some of the times in the paint where I feel like the defender was just on him and he was just a little bit too timid. And that goes to one of my improvements I like to see. I like to him to seek contact more in the paint. I know he needs to gain muscle, but if you're looking for the contact and you're being aggressive, we've seen smaller guys finish over bigger guys. It happens all the time in the NBA. I think he needs to be more okay taking the contact and finishing on the layups where you see sometimes he kind of takes it and then he goes backwards instead of trying to go forwards and kind of fight and that'll kind of lead to more free throws for him you mentioned the post defense three-point shooting obvious uh, i'd like to see him just not necessarily become a post player but just a couple more moves in the paint you know maybe just continue to work on the uh, the footwork we've seen that improve just a couple more things down there and you mentioned the rebounding i think it comes to two things you got to decide are you going to be a box you know a boxing out type of rebounder where you're just going to put a body in and get the boards or you're going to be the type that kind of attacks and goes up and gets it and i think he has the length and the athleticism to do that or we wanted to go the box out or whatever it may be i think he just needs to kind of figure out what he needs to do in terms of rebounding yeah i think he can do a little bit of both i think that that'll come and i think that you know as a guy who values rebounding more than anything it's probably his best skill in the basketball court individually um i think that he can do it in, in many aspects but in terms of the sort of post sort of moves as, as an offensive player nick i think yeah footwork is obviously that main thing and the fact that he has that ambidexterity you know he can be able to finish on either side of his body i think that he needs to use that to his advantage a little bit more and i think the coaches will probably recognize that in the off season um but as well yeah i think those are all areas that he can improve on and i think that he will um i, I think that obviously he's not going to be a finished product going into his age 21st 21 season uh, but i think he's going to continue to improve and i think that we will see some more really great moments from him throughout the season and um, i think in a similar way where we spoke about dn sort of russell you know, we want to cut out those really, really bad games where he's having a negative effect or we would rather him have like a more of a, a neutral effect in, or like, you know, we don't have to take him off the floor in, in, the, in the sort of latter parts of games where he's getting destroyed or, or put out the sort of backup defensive guy. We want Jared Allen to be the, the, the center of the future. I know there are some guys and some pundits out there who don't agree with it, but I'm still high on him. You know, he's a 21-year-old um big men and there aren't 21 21 year old big men in this league right now having an impact you know deandre ayton maybe but i think that you know he as much as he was on the all rookie team and had a good season i don't think he's a finished product in, in any sense of the word either especially you know, Joel, defensively exactly uh, he, he has a better frame uh, than our guy in jared allen but some guys are just built differently literally you know physiology just because you're six foot ten doesn't necessarily mean that you're born with you know a, a, an easy propensity to, to get muscles and and, and and get length around that sort of area um but i think that jared allen's going to improve and we need to to preach patience yeah i mean if you look at the improvement he made from college to his rookie season then from his rookie season to this season there's a lot of progress and if you were like want want to get rid of him you're just being impatient he's 21 and he was drafted as a project type player and he's already starting on a playoff team and he had really good moments in the playoffs he had bad moments as well and he had really good moments during the season there's plenty of stuff to see this is like the same exact thing if you were if you're saying to get rid of Jared Allen you would have been the Laker fan saying to get rid of D'Angelo Russell yeah exactly um so I think that yeah Jared Allen is going to be a Brooklyn Net, and I hope he, I hope he is, and I hope he continues to improve in a way that we all want from him. And you know, I think that one thing that was questioned was his mentality heading into the draft and before he was drafted. I think that's one area that you can't question of him. You know, despite the fact that he's not the loudest guy out there, he's not Joel Embiid, you know, posting stuff on Instagram or whatever. You don't need him to be that. There are guys that are just different characters, and, cool. and Jared Allen. And I, th yeah, exactly. I think that. You know, you need to just value guys for who they are. And I think that they can still, just because he's not the loudest guy out there, you know, when he got elbowed in the face by Joel Embiid, most guys would be flopping around like, you know, dead fish. But Joel Embiid, uh, Jared Allen just took it. You know, he just literally just took it, took it like a, like a man. Um, and I think that that's one area that we can, we can't question of him. Do not question his mentality. You know, his toughness. I think he's still, he's tough, but he's not necessarily, you know, a, a big bruiser. And I think in today's league, you know, I, I speak about it at length. Yes, you need toughness. Yes, you need these sort of guys, but you need them in specific aspects of the game. You need them to get rebounds. You need them to, you know, be there defensively. I don't think that guys that are like, you know, Reggie Evans in today's day and age are going to impact the league in a positive way. Um, you can't have that sort of one-minded, you know, single-minded skill set where you are just a tough guy. You know, I think that, you know, guys that look at, you know, Julius Randle, Marcus Morris, yeah, they're sort of tough and a bit bigger, but they're also can shoot. They're also gifted on both ends of the floor. So uh, I think Jared Allen's going to be fine. And 
um, I- I'm looking forward to his age 21 season. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Jack, before we finish up on Jared, where does he rank at the center position? I think he's he's pushing the top half now. I remember yeah. uh, I allude to my article for OGD Basketball where he can sort of push to that range of Clint Capella, Stephen Adams, where he's on the fringes of top five. Um, I'm not sure if he'll get to when he'll get to top five. If he'll get to top five, um, I'm a little you know more glass half empty on that sort of department because I think the center position is incredibly stacked right now, um, and I I think that. Most of those guys are pretty young too. You know, yep. I'm pretty sure Joel and B, Nicola Jokic, Carl Anthony Towns, all of them are under 25 years old. Yep. Um, and unless Jared Allen makes a tremendous jump, then I don't think he's going to be in their stratosphere. But I think he can be a really capable starting center like a Clint Capella, like a Steven Adams. And even Steven Adams, who's only 25 years old, has taken some steps back this season, partly because of that sort of big bruising sort of style of play that he does. And, you know, he gets banged up a little bit. You know, Clint Capella had an up and down postseason, you know, and obviously Jared Allen did too. So I think we wanted to to keep pushing and keep growing. And, you know, I don't think you want to put ceilings on these guys. I know Coach Kenny says that quite a bit. And, you know, Jared Allen is going to be a very good center in this league, how good he will be. Uh, I guess, again, my prototypical model is Miles Turner. I, if he can get to that level of play, um, I'll be incredibly happy. If he's just under a uh, Miles Turner, but he can still affect, be uh, a, a really, really, you know, top top or upper echelon, you know, defensive player, and then could hit the three and, you know, could do a little bit in the pick and roll, then I'll be very happy. Yeah, and I think the role he's going to have on the Nets based on the roster construction and the players they have, he's never going to really be asked to be a top five center. Like, he's never going to have the ball enough where he's going to be a Jokic, a Carl Anthony Towns, a Joel Embiid. I think he's more of a complementary piece, and that'll probably put him more in the top 10 range, like you mentioned, as, you know, his ceiling, like you said. He could still get higher than that. I could be wrong. But I just think in the role he's in, top 10 is where he could get to. And right now, I'd probably put him top 15, top 20. But I love his quickness and the potential of him being a very good, versatile defender. Like, you keep comparing to Miles Turner. I think if you can have that type of quickness on the perimeter, that's going to help you win playoff games. Games, that's going to help you make a run to the finals. He's unique, and I think we need to, to value that uniqueness um, and, and, and his skill set. And I think and continue to try to bridge the gap between his weaknesses with his strength and, and blah, blah, blah. But also, you know, focus and, and highlight the strengths that he does have and continue to grow them in a way that can make him a really dangerous player in his own right. And I think that, you know, Jared Allen is, is going to be, you know, a player in this league for a very long time. You know, he's proven it. There aren't many guys who in their second season will, will start, you know, 90, 95% of the games that they're in. Um, and, you know, he, he did that. And, and we're a playoff team. So I think that you need to give credit where credit's due. And at the same time, I think that throughout this podcast, we have highlighted the areas that he does need to grow. It's not necessarily to say that he is going to, you know, improve on all those sort of areas that we spoke about in terms of post defense and three-point shooting. Um, but I think that if he can bridge the gap in the sort of sense to, to repeat myself, then I think that he's going to be a very good player. And he already is a very good player, but very good and great. There's a there's a big gap towards that sort of mark. Yeah, I agree. And I think you mentioned earlier the mentality, and we've heard from the Nets players and coaching staff that he wants to be great. So I'm not concerned with the work ethic, and I think he'll get there. Like we said, you can't expect him to make some incredible, amazing jump from being, you know, a good center to being, you know, an all-star the next year. So I'm happy where he's at, and I'm patient with where he's going to be. And we'll all see how it all works out 2019-20. Jack, anything else you want to touch on, Jared Allen? No, I'm just uh, I'm I'm happy with where he's at. I'm looking forward to to, to where he can grow and, and how he grows in the off season. Um, one thing that you know I remember in, early in the season speaking about the fact that his free throw percentage was down. He got it back up to seventy percent. So I think that that's an area um, that I spoke about of any big man that I think is is an underrated sort of thing because they generally will get calls because they're the ones finishing the plays. And the fact that I think he started the season <clears throat> around sixty percent or so but then was able to bridge that gap and really get up to that 70% mark, I think shows uh, an underrated thing that I think goes under the radar for a guy like Jared Allen. We always focus on the negatives. He's not rebounding well enough. He's not doing this well enough. But I think the fact that he was able to get that number up to a really respectable mark for a big man in 70%, and I think that should be an aim for him throughout his career, especially if he's continuing to finish off plays, you know, but even bring it up a little bit to 75%, because I know Karis LeVert wasn't great from that range either. So um, Jared Allen was a very good free throw shooter. A little tidbit for, for guys that weren't necessarily watching that. 
Yeah, and I agree. I think uh, the fact he's already shooting such a great percentage, like he could definitely get closer to 75 or even to the high 70s and like a 79 because he already has a solid stroke. I think a lot of the mentality comes in the free throw line is like a confidence, is a mental game. And if he starts off well, it'll kind of help him as he progresses in the rest of his career. Definitely. All right, but I think that wraps it up for Jared Allen. Like Jack mentioned, you want to grab a Brooklyn Buzz t-shirt, head to designtree.com slash off the glass. You know, there's a promo code. Uh, does, what was it, Jack? Design5 for $5 off? Yes, sir. DSGN. Just in case people get confused, we'll, we'll be we'll be flogging it on the buzzers, on the bars and JBT. DSGNtree.com. Yeah, and you're ever confused and you want us, uh, we always hit us up on the DMs and we can kind of uh, throw it at you. And as always, check us out iTunes, Block Truck Radio, OTG Basketball.com, NetsRepublic.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. Reviews, five-star ratings are very much appreciated. And Jack, always a pleasure.